Walk to Moons chapter 40, The Gifts. It seemed fitting that at this point in my story of Phoebe, Gramps called out, Idaho! We were high in the mountains and had just crossed the Montana border into Idaho. For the first time, I believed we were going to make it to Lewiston by the next day, the 12th of August, my mother's birthday. Gramps suggested we pressed on to Coeur d'Alene about an hour away where we could just spend the night. From there, Lewiston was about 100 miles due south, an easy morning's journey. How does that sound to you, Gooseberry? Graham was still, her head pressed against the back of the seat and her hands folded in her lap. Gooseberry? When Graham spoke, you could hear the rattle in her chest. Oh, that's fine, she said. Gooseberry, you feeling okay? I'm a little tired, she said. We'll get you to a bed real soon. Gramps glanced back at me, troubled. Graham, if you want to stop now, that'd be okay, I said. Oh, no, she said. I'd like to sleep in Coeur d'Alene tonight. Your mama sent us a postcard from Coeur d'Alene, and it was on a bountiful blue lake. She coughed a long, rattly cough. Gramps said, okay, bountiful blue lake, here we come. Graham said, I'm so glad Peavy's mama came home. I wish your mama could come home too. Gramps nodded his head for about five minutes. Then he handed me a tissue and said, tell us about Mrs. Partridge. What was she doing leaving a gall dang envelope on Peavy's porch? That's what Phoebe and I wanted to know. Did you want something, Mrs. Partridge, I asked. She put her hands to her lips. Hmm, she said. Phoebe snatched the envelope and ripped it open. She read the message aloud. Don't judge a man till you've walked two moons in his moccasins. Mrs. Partridge turned to go. Bye-bye, she said. Mrs. Partridge, Phoebe called. We already had this one. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Partridge said. It was you, wasn't it, Phoebe said. You've been creeping around leaving these things, haven't you? Did you like them, Mrs. Partridge said. As she stood there in the middle of the sidewalk with her head tilted up at us and that quizzical look on her face, she looked like a mischievous child. Margaret reads them to me from the paper each day, and when there's a nice one, I ask her to copy it down. I'm sorry I gave you that one about the moccasins already. My noggin forgot. But why'd you bring them here, Phoebe said. I thought they would be grandiful surprises for you, like fortune cookies, only I didn't have any cookies to put them in. Did you like them anyways? Phoebe looked at me for a long minute. Then she went down the steps and said, Mrs. Partridge, when was it you met my brother? You said you didn't have a brother, Mrs. Partridge said. I know, but you said you met him. When was that? She tapped her head. Noggin, remember, let's see, some time ago, a week, two weeks? He came to my house by mistake. He let me feel his face. That's why I thought he was your brother. He has a very similar face. Isn't that peculiar? Phoebe said, no more peculiar than most things lately. As Mrs. Partridge tottered back to her house, Phoebe said, It's a peculiar world, Sal. She walked across the grass and spit in the street. She said, Come on, try it. I spit in the street. What do you think, Phoebe said? We spit again. It might sound disgusting, but to tell you the truth, we got a great deal of pleasure from those spits. I doubt if I'd ever explain what it was, but for some reason it seemed the perfect thing to do. And when Phoebe turned around and went into the house, I knew that it was the right thing for her to do too. With the courage in the, of that spit in me, I went to see Margaret Cadaver, and we had a long talk. And that's when I found out how she met my father. It was painful to talk with her, and I even cried in front of her. But afterwards, I understood why my father liked to be with her. Ben was sitting on my front steps when I got home. He said, I brought you something. It's out back. He led me around the side of the house, and there, strutting across the little patch of grass, was a chicken. I was never so happy in my life to see a chicken. Ben said, I named it, but you can change the name if you want. When I asked him what its name was, he leaned forward, and I leaned forward, and another kiss happened, a spectacular kiss. And Ben said, its name is Blackberry. Oh, Graham said, is that the end of the PB story? Yes, I said. That wasn't quite true, I suppose, as I could have told more. I could have told about how Phoebe getting adjusted to having a brother and to her new mother and all of that, but that part was still going on, even as we traveled through the mountains. That was a whole different story. I liked that story about PB, and I'm glad it wasn't too awfully sad. 
Graham closed her eyes, and for the next hour, as Gramps drove towards Coeur d'Alene, he and I listened to her rattly breathing. I watched her lying there so still, so calm. Gramps, I whispered, she looks a little gray, doesn't she? Yes, she does, Chickabitty. Yes, she does. He stepped on the gas, and we raced towards Coeur d'Alene.